There's a widespread idea that we could solve many of the problems in our food system if we could just find the time and energy to start cooking from scratch. We've forgotten how to cook, is one refrain. We spend more time watching cooking shows on TV than doing it ourselves, is another. And the worst one of all, and one that I've heard many times, is that we could solve the problem of food insecurity if poor people would just step away from McDonald's and remember how to cook. In a popular TED Talk, Jamie Oliver, a chef activist, declares, the home needs to start passing on cooking skills again. If you can cook, money doesn't matter. If you can cook, time doesn't matter. So what's wrong with these ideas? First, it's unfair. It's a way of blaming poor people for the inequalities in our food system. And second, it's not entirely accurate. Yes, the amount of time that Americans spend cooking has decreased in the last few decades, but lots of families in the United States cook quite a bit. And poor people actually cook more than middle-class families and eat less fast food because it's cheaper. But it's not necessarily the kind of food that we see idealized in cooking magazines and cooking shows. It's cheap food that lasts a long time and won't go bad. Things like ramen or box macaroni and cheese or hot dogs. Along with a team of NC State students and researchers, I've spent much of the last 10 years talking with poor and working class moms about how they cook, shop for food, and feed their families. Our research led to our book, Pressure Cooker, Why Home Cooking Won't Solve Our Problems and What We Can Do About It, as well as numerous articles. Today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what our research has to say about this idea that we can fix the food system by getting people to remember how to cook again. What we found in our research is that people care about food a lot, but it wasn't easy and most people felt that the meals that they made weren't measuring up in terms of how they wanted to feed their families or the messages they heard about how they should be cooking. I'm gonna tell you a story about one mom, Leanne, in order to illustrate the constant trade-offs that moms were forced to make around food and cooking. All of the things I'm going to share are real, but this is not her real name because we protected the confidentiality and privacy of all the people in our study. Leanne lived here in Raleigh and she had three kids two boys in elementary school, and a baby. She was a great cook. She loved feeding the people she cared about and experimenting with new recipes, and she loved thinking about food. But the advice of foodie chefs like Jamie Oliver, Michael Pollan, and others didn't resonate with Leanne's experiences. As part of our study, we accompanied Leanne and several of the other moms in the study to the grocery store. And on the way, we watched as Leanne literally debated whether she should pay an overdue medical bill, and if not, risk being taken to court, or buy food for her family for the weekend. Her mom was in the car with her. She said, let them take you to court. You have to feed your kids. And in fact, Leanne was constantly making trade-offs. In the grocery store, as she walked around, we watched as she literally picked up and put back foods when she decided she couldn't afford them. A lot of the trade-offs she made were about money, but it wasn't just money. For example, the only supermarket in Leanne's neighborhood had closed just before we started the study, and the only stores within walking distance were corner stores, which offered snacks and sodas, but not a lot of the healthy foods that she would use to make dinner for her kids. Leanne didn't have a car to get to the supermarket, which meant that when she went, she had to take a taxi, which cost lots of money, and ate into her food budget. She could take the bus, but the bus was slow, it often ran off schedule, and then she'd be forced with the problem of dragging all those grocery bags back on the bus. So like many of the moms in our study, Leanne tried to do her big shop once a month, which meant that she didn't end up buying a lot of fresh produce because that would go bad quickly. Even when she did, she didn't have a sharp knife, and her small fridge didn't hold that much. So even if she was able to stock up on lots of food, there was nowhere for it to go. 
Leanne worked at a fast food restaurant with a schedule that changed from week to week. In other words, her job involved feeding others, but it meant that she didn't even know from week to week if she'd be home in time for dinner. In short, Leanne's story shows how structural inequalities, for example, those tied to wages and work schedules, availability of affordable housing, access to transportation, and neighborhood food environments shape how people eat. If we don't address those inequalities, we're not going to improve people's access to food or reduce food insecurity. So what do we do? We need to start by realizing that we can't keep asking people to do better. American parents have less free time than they did in previous generations. And for people in some job sectors, like the service sector where Leanne worked, it's not just an issue of how much time they have, but how much control they have over their time. Food prices are going up, as many of us have noticed, and people don't have more money to spend on food. Money's tight already. We need to move away from this intense focus on individual families' dinner tables and focus on how we can collectively support access to good food for everyone. This means increasing access to the federal food assistance programs that provide critical food resources for so many people like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly known as Food Stamps. It means supporting universal school meal programs, which many more schools started offering during the pandemic because of some shifts in policies. When meal programs are universal, this eliminates the need for lunch debt and complicated accounting systems to see which kids owe how much money. It reduces stigma and ensures that more kids get the food they need and it makes it easier for harried parents to get their kids out the door in the mornings. And it means addressing other issues that don't seem on the surface like they're related to food, but really are. Guaranteeing living wages and paid parental leave to all workers, investing in public transportation, and making sure that everyone has access to quality health care. So you might be wondering, but what can I do today? In addition to supporting some of these big changes that we all need, there are some things that we can do as individuals. First, when other people cook for you, say thank you. In our observations of family meals for our research, we almost never saw someone say thank you. Appreciate the labor and the care that goes into cooking for and feeding others. If you don't regularly cook for your family or roommates, think about learning a new recipe or two so that you can share the work. And finally, stop judging people for how they eat or how they feed their families. As we say in my house, don't yuck my yum. We can celebrate what food means in our own lives and our families without shaming other people for their food choices or demonizing certain foods. In the end, food matters, and all families should be able to sit down to a good meal at the end of the day. But we're not gonna get there by telling people to return in mass to the kitchen. Instead, we need to think outside the kitchen and do what it takes to make food, health, and well-being more equitable to all.